Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on such short notice. Uh, my name is Captain Sandy Aretino. I'm the CEO for Fort Defiance Hospital. Um, we felt it was really important to pull everybody together today to just kind of talk about the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, and talk about what we're doing as a facility and what we need each of you to do as community members, employees, um, you know, every aspect of that. And we've got this great team of people that has been working on this. Um, each of them will come up and kind of talk about their different piece. So we've stood up the incident command system just so we can be in preparation for this. The last thing we want to do is ignore it, not deal with it because it's scary, and then have to deal with it when it becomes scary. So um, we want to talk about that today. And one thing I wanted to say is just Everybody sort of do the British thing and keep calm and carry on. That's the biggest message I want to say moving forward, despite you know some of the planning events we're going to talk about today. And I was just thinking that um, Katie Barron and I, and you'll meet her in a second. We're talking about how you know we're this is it's, we've got all these other things that we're trying to manage. And I was thinking of a really bad parenting moment I had a few days ago. Last week, my son got in trouble at school because he was sassy to his teacher. And we're texting back and forth as I'm driving home and I'm yelling at him, telling him, you know, I can't believe you did this. And I seriously caught myself saying, I can't manage you being sassy to your teacher and this coronavirus all at the same time. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, <laughs> calm down. I, I don't have to control the virus. So I want everybody to just kind of keep that into perspective. Let's not pile on, basically, is the message here. Let's keep doing our jobs. Let's not panic. We're not piling on one work issue, you know, being shorthanded, da 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 da, and the coronavirus all at the same time. Okay? So, Lyle Log is going to do our opening prayer for us. So, I'd like to turn the floor over to you next, and then we'll give it to Katie. So, come on up. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yate Ben Chikido Shidane. So I go ahead and uh, start my prayer now. <coughs> Could <laughs> The <laughs> Sneaky. <laughs> Jot <laughs> Eya, 
Hey, I engine no e is your hunt had a din at him but how e ye call on it, it all is even yet home. At East Pa Hayagi, to do ban Saha Kesgi, at this at Ligi, at the at dance as a kiss to at this yo joint in Lingi e quag, is she ban yat in little deep in the beer co. Geno coya, sad yard at his about the Hajoni, a bitch had it to a quabby. Aya, a sign it long aya, aya, a car teacher, and so a shinned the hot deep in the beer. I don't hot all a eight so there's an lean a pinch had this see in Leco. Halla a eighty no hocardi in the nanny cleany ho. Nasty the whole G she a eight on his bells and then let ho. Do a batch at neat eight and lean let ho. A call a hashin so sabe yat kid open hot ado ban saki seed or ban yat kio, to hot all a eight a will dote a blood a hill G shin leco. A hot all eight so there's an lean a pinch had this see in I do a hair quite engino, he an eye can leco, nasty nature a hot edolish and so a dishin leco. I do a dish quite anil so a shiny synago. Nihe Jane hints a case in leaning hubbard at the deal chill, a nayad a bajoni comping his lahon of sodolis, coining him in his eye has cheeky home. A denan he dohness and hana no chit and little list and so a dishin leco. Or had I so doesn't be her steam and little list. De be her at it or shut up. I think don't know how costly it's neat yash need day. Ah, to the inch, I don't have sleep, lead on it. I don't sleep, I Thank you, Lyle. So let me, let me introduce um, Katie. She's going to show a video, correct, um, that gives a little bit of the background on the COVID 19. Um, Katie, is, is sort of new to the organization, but she has dealt with similar situations in Africa. Her and Dr. Um, D'Andrea actually worked in Sierra Leone, Africa on the Ebola outbreak and worked with the, the groups of people there to kind of control the outbreak and um, help people there. So this, she comes by this work, honestly. So I'll turn the floor over to her. She'll talk about the video and then move into the rest of the agenda. Uh, yate. My name is Katie Barron. Uh, my mother's clan is of Irish clan, or Irish, yes, Irish clan. Uh, my father's clan is from Colorado and New Mexico. Um, uh, I started here at Fort Defiance um, back in July. I'm the manager of the mobile health program. Um, and I, before that, I was in Flagstaff working as an infection um, infectious disease nurse practitioner. And prior to that, I was in um, West Africa. Um, and prior to that, I'm from Boston, and that's where I spent most of my um, career. Um, so thank you guys all for coming. Um, we're going to show a video um, that is a, a physician in Toronto, Canada. And he does a good job of um, briefly explaining um, what coronavirus is. Um, and then I will do a very brief clinical overview because um, I know most of us are getting lots of information. Um, so we'll just do a brief overview of the virus um, and then a brief overview of what's going on in the United States. And then we'll talk about a little bit about the incident command system, um, what we've been doing and what we're hoping to do with all of you moving forward. So we need to get the facts straight. How does this virus work? How does it transmit? Where does it want to go? And let's protect ourselves. I'm Dr. Peter Lin. I'm a family physician in Toronto, Canada. The coronavirus is a family of viruses that can cause as mild things as just a common cold, all the way up to SARS or MERS. These are these bad pneumonias that we're talking about. And basically what these viruses are, they look like a tennis ball with all these spikes sticking out of it. And depending on the type of spike, it allows that virus to attach to certain places. So some viruses, they have the spike that attaches to your nose. So basically you just get a common cold. But the SARS virus and this new virus that we're talking about has the spike that allows it to attach to the cells in your lung. And when it attaches there, it puts in information to make photocopies of itself. So it uses our equipment to make more viruses. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. Most of the coronaviruses live in animals. In this particular case, it was from Wuhan. There was a fish market where they were selling live animals. And the thought is, is that the virus was in a live animal, then it crossed into a human. But then what we found was that people were getting sick 
in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of family members that were looking after them, which now meant that the virus can pass from human to another human. Just like all viruses, it needs to reach a target, which is your lung, and it has to get there with your help. It has no feet and no wings, so therefore it needs us to move it there. So that's why we keep saying, don't hang around sneezy people because you're gonna breathe it in, and don't touch your face because that's how the virus is gonna get in. The masks are helpful, but they're not necessary because they're leaky. The ones that you and I buy basically have pockets here, so therefore the virus can get in. What the masks really do is they stop us from touching our face. If you're sick, we tend to mask you, so therefore you're not spewing out the viruses to other people sitting around you. The true people that have the real masks are the N95. Those are sealed. These are for the doctors that may be caring uh, for the patients. So in the beginning, the coronavirus will cause kind of like flu-like symptoms or a cold. So people just get the stuffy nose, that kind of thing. But you'll understand that as soon as that virus starts manufacturing in your lung cells, they're producing all these copies of the virus, all of a sudden now you kill the lung cells. So now you can't exchange oxygen. And that's why one of the early symptoms is people get very short of breath and they tend to have a difficult time breathing and that's why they end up in hospital. So currently, unfortunately, we don't have a direct treatment for the coronavirus. So we don't have a medication that can kill it off. And so it's really supportive. So in other words, the patient can't breathe. We give them oxygen, help them to breathe. They can't drink, so therefore we give them fluids to support them. Their kidneys begin to shut down. We help them with all those things. So it's a very supportive process. This is a new virus that we've never seen before. So our immune system, our army, are having a hard time figuring out what to do. So usually what we have to do is we make something called antibodies. So these are things that can grab onto the spikes that we see on the virus and it'll get rid of the virus for you and that will actually bring you back to good health. So therefore the elderly may have a worse outcome and of course the young children, so the babies, their immune system is not so good either so they may not make those antibodies as well. So just remember your hands may be with virus. Virus cannot hurt you because it can't get through the skin but the moment I do this now I've brought the virus right to where it wants to go. So let's remember not to touch our hands to our face. So let's say you think that you might have been on a plane or you might have bumped into somebody that has it. What should you do? So the first thing is to contact a healthcare worker to tell them that potentially you have it. If you're feeling symptoms and you're going to go into a facility, call ahead. Okay, so whether you're calling the paramedics or whether you're calling the hospital or your doctor, just mention that you were on a flight. If you don't have any symptoms, then what we do is a little bit of a self-quarantine. In other words, we can just keep you away from other people, and so you don't go into parties, don't go with your friends, don't go into public transportation. So we can contain it very easily by making sure that you do a self-confinement, so to speak, uh, for the, let's say, seven to 14 days is the longest incubation time. So after that, if you're feeling well, then you don't have anything to worry about. So if we get the facts right, then we don't have to be overly worried, but we do the right things so that we don't get the virus ourselves and that we don't pass it on to others. And if we look after each other in this way, this virus will have nowhere to go. It needs us to move it, it needs us to make copies for it, and if we don't help it, then the virus will stop. So we have the power to do that right now. So I really like that video because it kind of puts it all together and makes it approachable. Um, I think we're going to post that on our Facebook page so people can access it, not just here, but also in the community. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of the virus. I could talk about viruses and bacteria for days. If you want to do that later, I'm happy to do so. Um, but I won't bore you. But I just want to do a brief overview for the clinicians um, in the room and then for people that are interested. And so similar to what the physician just said, um, most of the time, I would say 80% of the time, people have mild symptoms. Um, and the people that really get um, the severe symptoms tend to be um, the older people in this, in this virus, in this, in this epidemic. We have not seen any pediatric fatalities, fortunately. Um, however, 
we have not controlled the virus and it's still um, being transmitted. So there's always risk for mutation and changes in this clinical presentation. But right now, um, if people have severe illness and are requiring um, hospitalization for a period of time, the, the, the way it's presenting is more of a, a complicated bilateral pneumonia. Um, and then there's some, um, I won't get into the details, but there, there's some clinical components um, that happen as well. The other thing that's a little tricky with this virus is we don't know the history of it. We don't know how it acts. We know how other viruses act. We know how corona, the other coronaviruses that are in the communities act. But this one we're still trying to figure out. NIH and other big um, CDC are looking at the specifics of how this uh, virus likes to um, survive. Um, so right now, um, the incubation period, so the period of time, say I, um, I sit next to someone that has the virus, I touch them, or, and then I touch my mouth, um, I may not show symptoms for 14 to 21 days. And so that makes it tricky for management. It makes it tricky for containment. And so it's just something to think about. And I know there's a lot of information coming out. Sometimes it's seven days. Sometimes it's 14 days. Don't worry about that. There's other ways that we can focus on containing this, and then you can leave the, the numbers and the science to the clinicians that have experience with these viruses. Um, so I'll stay on the negative train. So right now we don't have a treatment, so no medications kill this virus yet. They are working on it, uh, the, the scientists um, in the NIH. We do not have a vaccine, again, um, it's being worked on as we speak. Um, so right now it's supportive therapy, um, fluids, pain control, anxiety control. Uh, just yesterday the WHO increased the mortality rate. I think because this is evolving, it's really hard to make statistics when you're in the middle of an epidemic. So right now it's at 3.4%. So higher than influenza, which is 0.1% mortality rate. But again, it's, it's unfortunately our, our older, our older um, folks, our grandparents, um, that are tending to be so severe that there's fatality. Um, and right now, uh, and we'll get to this next with the case definition, right now um, it's believed in the, in the, here in the U.S. that it's now a community transmission, meaning it's not just someone that traveled to those high-risk countries. Now it can be, you know, we don't really know um, who has it. So right now, um, the case definition is changing daily, but we have been using these uh, three questions, and actually it was two to start, and we added uh, the top one here. Um, so, and it's an example of why it's now community. So we, we want to ask people or see people if they have a severe respiratory illness, um, and we don't have any other explanation, it's not flu, it's not RSV, then we need to consider them a person of interest that could possibly have this virus. So that's why it makes it a little bit more challenging, and that's one of the reasons why we created a team so that we can come up with clinical plans um, to address that. It is still recommended that we ask about travel, um, but I, th I think over time that this will shift. And then the third question that we ask is if you've had contact with a known positive, uh, a person with a positive um, COVID-19 lab test. <clears throat> so uh, a couple things that are important for us here. Um, it's really important that we learn how to protect ourselves as healthcare workers. In any sort of outbreak, healthcare workers are always um, the, the folks that get are, have, are the ones that get the sick the most because we're frontline, we're interacting with, with people who are ill. And so we have precautions and most of us in this room know those. We do them every day. We do them with someone with influenza, with tuberculosis, so we know how to protect ourselves. And so we should reassure ourselves when we start to get nervous or we're, we're, we're going down the rabbit hole that we know how to do this. We're experts at how to safely take care of people so that we ourselves don't get sick and then pass it on to our family. So um, there's also been a change in the recommendations for, for precautions for COVID-19. So the WHO who's been working over in Asia where there's been lots of cases has made a recommendation and now the Arizona State Department has also made this recommendation um, that we are just on standard precautions and droplet precautions. 
and you only use airborne precautions, so an N95 mask and a negative pressure airflow. You only use that when you're doing uh, medical procedures where you could cause the virus to come out of the mouth and to, um, to get in the air and then come to you. So for the most of us, we do not need to use the N95 masks. So a surgical mask is sufficient. Um, and just one more comment on that. So the CDC has made these same recommendations for long-term long care facilities, but has not made them for healthcare facilities, but they are also working to make those changes as soon as possible. So if you get questions about that, that's why. So a little information about what's going on now here today in the United States. Um, as of right now, we have a total of 106 persons that are um, positive for COVID-19, confirmed positive. Um, there's unfortunately been 11 persons who have passed away. Um, majority have been in Washington state. Um, states involved right now are 15 in number, and there's three states that have declared state of emergency, Washington, uh, Florida, and California. Um, and as I said earlier, there's been no pediatric fatalities in the United States, which is pretty, pretty good, and hopefully it stays that way. Um, here in Arizona, we had a, a, a positive confirmed case uh, about a month ago. Um, I don't know the, the clinical details of that patient, um, but I believe it was down in the Phoenix area. And just Tuesday, we had um, a, a positive presumptive case, thank you. So what that means is the patient, and I'll talk about this patient a little later in my presentation, but this patient had a positive first swab that was sent to the Arizona State Department. Um, and so it's presumptive because it needs to be have confirmatory testing in CDC in Georgia or in Atlanta. So we, write, we don't know yet, um, but we have high suspicion because this person also had direct contact or with a positive, a confirmed positive case. So given all of this different information um, last week, um, it, hospital administration decided that we needed to put together an incident command team and system. So last Thursday, I believe, was the first day that we got together, and we started talking about what that looks like. At that time, we created a team um, that I believe was emailed to everyone with a list of people, um, and I kind of thought about it over the weekend. Um, and so that incident command team is a guideline that FEMA uses for emergency preparedness. And we're a healthcare organization that I think is a little more complex. And so I thought we need, I would draw my experience and kind of make it a little bit more fluid, um, but still have chains of command and chains of communication. Um, so I'll show you the, how our team has expanded, and then I'll also show you what I've named the COVID task force um, does. Um, the incident command team meets daily. Uh, we meet at 7.45 every morning for 30 minutes um, to discuss um, briefly um, wh where we're at. So we have different officers that give a report. And just, we don't do any deep diving planning there. It's more to have a, a discussion, uh, situation update and then task assignment. And then we also are, um, our, one of our other functions is to decide what tier of risk we as an organization are in. And I'll explain that what the tiers of risk are in a few minutes. Um, and then lastly, the COVID task force is more of a working body. So it's, it's uh, leaders from different departments that will have uh, lots of conversations, uh, lots of planning, lots of educating, and so I'll talk a little bit more when we get to that. So this is our incident command team. Um, myself, I'm the incident commander. Um, I also put a, a different level that's different from FEMA, and so I created a director level um, so that I myself don't have 25 people coming to me every day with reports because that's too much for one person to um, put together. So I um, asked Zita Guerrero to be our infection prevention control um, director. Dallas Elworth is our communications director. Dr. Whalen is our medical director. Uh, Jaron Prowse is our operation director. And uh, Cindy Garcia is our safety director. And I'll have them come up at the end when we open this up for some Q and A. Um, but there are also people you can go to if you have questions. Um, and then, 
Um, over on the left, um, our planning officer is Siona Willie, our public health nurse uh, lead. Um, our liaison officer is Robert Platero. I don't believe he's here today, um, but he's returning today. Our clinical operation officers are Dr. Uh, Roger Begay, Dr. Price, Dr. Young. Um, our clinical nursing officer is Jennifer Don Gilly. Our um, emergency department clinical officer is Gwen Sorrell. Our safety officer is Jennifer Yazi. Our HR officer is Rael. I cannot pronounce your last name. Oger, thank you. Sorry, Rael. <laughs> and our finance officer is Christine Bishenti. Um, so we meet every morning, um, and it's not to be exclusive. Uh, other people from our task force are welcome to come to the meeting. It's more that we sit around, we give report, and we decide where we're going that day. And so it's hard when you have 25 people in a room to make decisions. And when you're in an emergency, you need to be able to act quickly and respond and change course when you need to to protect your staff. So I'm, you probably can't see this, but we will give access to, to this slide um, on our intranet. Um, but this is the organogram. So this is, again, fluid. It changes. Um, it allows us to have conversations across many disciplines. Um, so this is also, I wanted to show it so you know that we're working on multiple levels of this virus and controlling the epidemic preparing us, educating us, and getting us safe so that we feel like we can give safe clinical care. And also protect the community, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the tier system um, is a way that we, can, it's a framework, so how we can talk about planning for an emergency. Uh, last week when we started, we were all over the place because we were scared, we didn't know what to do, and so, when I sat at home thinking about like, what's the best way to discuss my experiences and how do you organize this? I thought, you know, we're not in an, a red zone right now. We don't have many patients showing up here. So I created a tier system. Uh, so it's three tiers. I like to think of it as a triangle. The bottom tier, tier one, uh, was named watchful preparedness. And that's, uh, you know, where we were last Thursday. Uh, we're starting to talk about the epidemic. We're looking at it closely. We're watching the epidemiology of it. And then we're also starting to talk about and prepare for educating and training all of you. Um, and then talking about what it means to do screening and isolation. Is it different than what we're currently doing or do we need to, to reassess? And then also taking inventory. I'm sure some of you have gotten requests of what PPE do you have, what masks do you have? And this is really important in this epidemic because across the world, we have a lack of resources related to specifically to this virus. So namely masks um, is our biggest issue uh, as far as uh, supply chain. Um, so we're, we're actively looking at that. And then as far as the organization as a whole, it's business as usual. We're still seeing patients in primary care. We're still seeing people in the dental clinic. clinic so there's no real change. Um, and then the next tier is called enhanced screening and IPC measures. So that is kind of a tricky, it's kind of tricky to go from level one to travel level two because there's not a huge change. But we decided as a group that we wanted to look at around us, like vicinity. So if there was a case that showed up in Phoenix or Albuquerque, what does that mean for us? Or if there's a change in how this virus is responding or if, you know, looking at those critical things that could affect us today or tomorrow. Um, and that, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, we decided on Tuesday to move from tier one to tier two um, and that reasoning was because there was uh, that presumptive case in Maricopa County. So this case was a 27-year-old gentleman um, who returned uh, back from France uh, to the United States on January 28th. Um, and he presented to an urgent care in Maricopa County uh, with symptoms of cough, fever, shortness of breath. He was admitted to a different hospital um, and was treated inpatient for uh, pneumonia. He was then discharged home. Um, the Florida State Department called the Arizona State Department two days after he was left, discharged from the hospital and uh, said that he had a close contact with a known positive case. Um, so that was concerning. They went out to his house. Um, they asked him to be on home quarantine. 
and they um, and he was clinically stable, which was great. Um, and they tested him, and the the case came back presumptive positive. Um, that that sample is now at the CDC, and we're awaiting confirmation. But because he had close contact with a known positive, it's pretty likely that it's positive. Um, so that's a concern because Maricopa County is not far from here. We all travel back and forth, or so, some of us travel back and forth quite frequently there. Um, this is a transient community. Arizona in general is a transient community. So that increases our risk um, that the potential of somebody coming in with similar symptoms. So we decided to um, move up to tier two. And it happened very quickly. This is changing day by day. And so um, it caused a lot of commotion amongst us. To, I'm sure people heard about it um, here in this room and, and on online. So we decided that um, we wanted to get together quickly with supervisors, talk about this, and ask them to come up with plans for infection prevention control. Um, so I'm going to probably, do you mind going one more? So these are some of the things that we're working on right now. Um, I'm gonna ask that Jerem, Dallas, Sean, and Dr. Whalen, or sorry, Dr. D and Dr. Whalen um, come up. Good morning, everybody. So um, I'm in charge of operations for this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jerem Prouse. I'm a lifelong resident here um, in the community. So. Our main goal with this is to protect you all, protect your grandmas, your grandpas, your kids, all of our loved ones. So with that, when we went to tier two, what we decided to do is make some, they're not really drastic changes, but there's some physical changes that are gonna happen here at the facility. Um, one of those is the modified patient flow. Can you go to the next slide? So on this map, you'll notice starting tomorrow, is where, where that's the official tier two date of when we're gonna go live. You'll notice down here on the south side, that's the south mall entrance, and the entrance by the cafeteria, we're gonna lock those doors. They're still gonna be accessible for emergency cases in case we gotta get out. You can still exit those, but they're gonna be locked for patient entry into the hospital. There's gonna be only two ways into the hospital from a patient standpoint. It's, the, it's highlighted to number one, on both sides, one at the emergency area and one at the front entrance of the hospital. The reason why we're doing this is because we wanna to try to control a suspected case of the COVID-19. We don't want somebody randomly coming in here through the cafeteria, sitting over here, coughing up a lung, and us not catching it, you know? And then 15 minutes later, all of us have been walking by them, you know, now there's a whole bunch of other presumed cases, possibly, that's gonna be disastrous to try to try to track all that. So we're trying to, do our due diligence and catch this up front. Um, we don't want to give it a place to live. Like the video said, we're trying to prevent a place for it to live. So by doing this, we're going to have pre-screening areas. Do you want to talk about the pre-screening? Morning, everyone. My name is Sean DeAndrea. I'm an ER doc now here at Fort Defiance. I've worn a few different hats. Um, oh, thank you. Well, come on down, see me in the ER. Um, I got... Um, I just have to say, it's always hard to follow Jerem because he's like so well dressed. He's like the best dressed speaker. So we got to work. Next time I'm going first and then you can follow. So, um, so be honest, who's, who's watching the news? Uh, all those hands should go up. I know the first thing I do is roll over, grab my phone, look online, see what, I check CDC as well. And it's a scary time. I mean, there's things are changing and the, you know, all those news outlets, they make money by scaring us. So we buy more papers, we click on more things. So, um, you know, we'll talk about, and we've been talking about, we can talk about, you know, how an epidemic flows, but I would just say, let's just take a moment. Let's take all that nervous energy. I'm only nervous because I'm talking to 800 people. I'm not nervous about the virus. So. Um, but let's take that nervous energy and let's use it to make sure we're following the guidelines that are put forth. That's the only thing we can do. And if you do that, I'm confident that we can all be safe. So in the morning, after you've looked at whatever you, whatever you look at, whatever news outlet, and you feel that surge of adrenaline come through you, just take a deep breath and try to think about what we talked about today or what you saw Dallas post on the website about how to keep yourself and your family safe. It's not that hard, actually, but you have to be mindful. And the fear, is, the fear clouds the brain. And what we need are our brains to be sharp and just remember what we're doing and pay attention. So... Um, Dr. Aretino, 
pointed out to the fact that Katie and I actually worked in Ebola in Sierra Leone in 2015. And we've reflected on that in the past week and a half, and I'll tell you that that was a much different animal. That was, um, it was a much more um, deadly virus. Um, but what made that situation feel, I felt unsafe there. I'll tell you, I feel very safe here. I feel safe when I come to work. I'm not afraid to see patients. I'm not afraid to see any of you. I feel extremely safe here. I didn't feel safe every day in Sierra Leone. It's because the system was, was weak. The, the health system in that country, unfortunately, is very weak, but the system that we were working in was, was weak, and that's what made it feel unsafe. And so your leadership, the incident command team, they're meeting every day to make sure our system is as safe and as strong as it can be. And I'll tell you, I'll end this part. This is my little editorial section. Then I have to talk about the screening. But the, um, you know, as I said, I'm going to say it again. I feel safe when I come to work. If we have a positive patient in the ER, you, Alex and Kid, you can sign me up. I feel safe going and taking care of that patient in the ED because we know what to do. Um, and I'll tell you, in, in an unsafe system, Sometimes you feel like the hot zone or the red zone is the safest place because you know what you're up against. And what we're going to talk about now is screening so that the entire hospital um, really knows what's going on. We're tracking these patients. But um, again, we have a strong system here. And I'm going to end on some really good news, something that the press doesn't talk about. Um, what you're all probably seeing, and we're all employees of a healthcare system, you're probably paying attention to the fact that a lot of healthcare facilities got caught unaware. And you've read about patients who have been stuck on an inpatient unit for five days before the CDC let them test, and now they're tracking all these healthcare providers. We're ahead of the game. We're, we have the benefit. This thing's been going on for about three months now. Uh, the folks in China, they really got caught unaware, and then in all the other countries, it's part of why it spread is because they, they didn't have lead time. We've had lead time. We've had a chance to prepare in ways that all these other affected hospitals didn't have. So that should be very reassuring is that we are ahead of the game. Um, so on the screening part that, that Jerem talked about, this will kick off tomorrow as part of tier two. Uh, we're gonna limit the patient and personnel traffic to a couple of different entrances. And it's gonna be a very simple screening process. If um, at our, things change a little bit, so I think at our last meeting we talked about a nurse and security personnel. It's gonna, and these folks will probably have surgical masks on, so that's just because they're gonna be face to face with a lot of people. So you should expect them to have a surgical mask on. That's the right thing to do. And they'll be just asking folks, you know, are, what are you here for? And are you having any respiratory symptoms? And they'll run through just a short list. Cough, cold, fever, chills, that sort of thing. And then the folks will be directed to where they're going. You know, most people who come here um, probably aren't sick. They're here for a scheduled appointment. They're here to pick up their medications. So they're going to be directed to those clinics. Anybody who's coming in with a cough, cold, fever, chills, they're going to be directed to um, ED fast track or uh, peds, but they're going to have a mask on, so they're going to be masked. And anybody who's coming in to pick up their meds or to go to a scheduled appointment who happens to have something, most likely a common cold or allergies, and they're coughing a little bit, they're going to get a mask too. Okay, so um, we want to let people know exactly what that will look and feel like ahead of the time and the reason for it, because this is the best thing we can do at this point. All right? Okay, who's next? Let me borrow that tie next time. <laughs> so one thing I didn't touch bases on, all the employee accesses where your badge works, those will still be active and still live. Um, again, this is fluid. It's been changing for the most part every 12 hours. We come up with a plan, we go home, we text each other, we come back to work and it changes again. You know, So just be flexible with these changes. You know, um, They're still new. Um, but like Dr. DeAndre said, we all feel safe, and we're only doing this to keep this area safe and everybody else safe. Um, go back to the other slide, please. So we talked about um, some of those items on there. One thing that I want to mention is you'll start seeing by Sunday evening, Monday morning, we're going to make it a requirement for everybody to go through Relias training um, to see and watch a video about PAPRs. You don't need to get certified yet to, to, or fit tested for those, but we want everybody to have the knowledge to wear a PAPR. So that's going to be a requirement. We're going to put a week-long um, timeline on that, and as well as a PPE video on there about donning and doffing, um, really for the clinical and the frontline staff that might have to treat a patient with uh, COVID-19. So um, just be aware that that's going to be coming out. I'll turn it over to you. you have anything? Dallas? 
All right, so I'm Alex Whelan. I'm the Chief of Emergency Medicine here. I'm acting as the Medical Director for the Incident Command Team and kind of working with uh, specifically all of the, the clinical supervisors here in the hospital. Um, I don't have too much to add to that, uh, you know, to Sean's words there. You know, I also work in the emergency department and I also feel very safe here. I feel like we have a good plan. Um, we are working individually with every, every department that has interactions with patients to make plans for screening, for safety, for our employees, for our patients. And that all is already in the implementation phase um, and really kicking off strong tomorrow. So it's not gonna be things that everyone will see um, outright. It's not gonna, you're not gonna see huge sweeping changes uh, during your normal interactions, but just uh, rest assured that we are, we are taking this very seriously and making those, implementing those plans for, for keeping everybody safe. Uh, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Dallas Ellsworth. I am the Director of Marketing, and for the ICS team, I am the Director of Communications. Um, as far as communications go internally, um, the last few days have really just been trying to create a streamlined um, communication system with the I ICS, and then now we're rolling it out to supervisors. So we, we, we created a Google document drive folder that we've been putting all of the information we need all the way down to clinical procedures, to what the CDC is putting out, down to um, posters from the CDC. And we've made that available to as many supervisors and directors as possible. Um, that is, if you're a supervisor or a director who have not received access to that, let me know. We can give you access to that. And we really want to give you, supervisor and directors, as much resources as possible to communicate to your team, to your staff at huddles, at staff meetings, uh, feel free. This slide will be on there. Um, all of our daily briefing slides will be on there. So you can actually get that. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to um, keep things secret. We're trying to put as much possible information, correct, up-to-date possible information to you because I think that's the real um, uh, danger is when incorrect information and um, not being informed um, drives up the fear. Um, as far as the community, um, we've reached out to IHS Area Office and to the Navajo Nation. IHS Area Office is really focusing on the clinical side for IHS facilities, um, and they've uh, referred us to Navajo Nation, who's going to try and handle a lot of the um, community outreach and informing the community. As far as us as a facility, uh, we are going to start putting together a lot of information um, to put out to the community as well. Uh, one of this is to communicate our tier system and to communicate the changes that will be coming up. Um, if there is anything that you need to be posted, printed, um, feel free to put in a work order form. Um, I would just put the COVID-19 right before it, right somewhere inside the, the title, so we know that this is related to this situation and we can try and um, get that informa information out as quickly as possible.